is the European History Lecture for <clears throat> Friday, the 17th of September, 2021. The Little Ice Age creates a climatological misery that the Europeans have to contend with in the late Middle Ages. And you will see a difference in the effervescent culture of the High Middle Ages, roughly the late 900s AD through the early 1200s, and the late Middle Ages, 12, 1400s. There is a grimness that has to do with just a harsher uh, <clears throat> lifestyle that they're forced to deal with. This is going to overshadow a lot of other things, creating tensions that are going to pressurize institutions, uh, sometimes distorting them out of all recognition. The Hundred Years' War is not a byproduct necessarily of the Little Ice Age, but it's an example of the kind of late medieval suffering that people have to deal with. The King of England, should I say, generations of kings of England, and generations of kings of France, and noblemen and citizens or subjects on both sides, are striving to resolve once and for all who rules France. And because they are fully committed to this project, the full wherewithal of both countries is deployed in service of victory. Ultimately, the French win, which as an admirer of the British Empire, which makes my Irish ancestors literally spin in their graves, um, I think is a good thing. Because had Britain, had England uh, ended up ruling France, there probably would be no recognizable British Empire and maybe no United States. Um, but because England was kicked off the continent, by their defeat in the Hundred Years' War, they actually made it um, their business to explore and exploit and conquer elsewhere. So, we talked about the Longbow, Battle of Agincourt, <clears throat> St. Joan of Arc. I mentioned the Wars of the Roses, and... We concluded last class with a classic from the history of cinema, the Russian movie Alexander Nevsky from 1938. <clears throat> In 1938, Yosef Vissarionovich Yugoslavia, or Joe Stalin, which means Joe Man of Steel, uh, is contemplating the possibility of a war with Nazi Germany. So he encourages the production of this film, which involved a cast of thousands, um, which tells the story of the great hero of medieval Novgorod. Novgorod, which if you've ever played Witcher 3, The Wild Hunt, is a basis for the city of Novigrad. Uh, Novgorod is a northwestern city uh, of Russian culture under Mongol domination. Alexander had won a great battle on the river Neva, and so he is called Nevsky at the time when the battle against the Teutonic Knights occurred on the frozen surface of Lake Pskov. And this movie, as you saw, depicts the Teutonic Knights as satanic evil out of hell. Now, the truth is, a lot of history is made by geography. Geography is the bones of history. And here we have, from the Pyrenees Mountains, stretching to the Ural Mountains and into Siberia, all the way to the Pacific, what in Europe is called the North European <coughs> Plain. Now, the North European Plain is basically open country with some hills, with some forests, with some swamps, with some rivers but with no good, solid mountain frontiers. The Romans discovered, to their dismay, that rivers don't make the best of borders. And right now, with the 
<clears throat> entirely man-made border crisis uh, between us and uh, Mexico, the Rio Grande River, which is the border between Texas and northern Mexico, is not proving to be an effective barrier at all. Because of this geography, where France stops, where the Netherlands or Belgium or Luxembourg begins, where Germany then begins, where Poland then begins, where white Russia or uh, what is called today Belarus begins, where Lithuania begins, Latvia, Estonia, where Finland begins, where Russia begins, where the Ukraine begins, where Hungary ends. All of these questions are not resolved by geography. They are resolved by force of arms. Might makes right. Warfare and the borders at the end of the last war determine, for example, whether Poland will even exist. Its neighbors, you're going to see up ahead, spoiler alert, Prussia, Russia, and Austria are going to gobble it up in a series of partitions. As Stalin is looking at Germany, he sees a threat because the Russians and the Germans are two of the strongest peoples, nations, in Central and Eastern Europe. Now, there was a time now when we're studying in the late Middle Ages when Poland, alongside Lithuania, dominated Central to Eastern Europe. Russia was still being born as the Grand Duchy of Muscovy, and Germany was the <clears throat> Holy Roman Empire, a divided federal union that was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, according to the French philosopher Voltaire. It was not a superpower. As such, there is a history of genuine animosity amongst the peoples of Central and Eastern Europe because so many of them have had their nation stolen by their neighbors or reduced to a state of dependency. <clears throat> the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, existed after World War I, were absorbed by Hitler and Stalin during World War II, and uh, by the Soviets until the fall of the Communist Empire in the early 1990s. And now they are independent again. So because of the open geography, a lot of the history of Europe is a history of who will control what region within the North European plain. So the natural enemy of the Russians, <clears throat> Stalin is arguing, are the Germans. And so it has been for 500 years since the Teutonic Knights tried to capture Novgorod. Uh, and trust me, the Germans have their own variants of these legends themselves. And certainly in the time of communism, there were reasons to. So you saw a stylized movie from the 1930s that harmonizes the music of Sergei Prokofiev with the visuals of Sergei Eisenstein. I think Eisenstein made this. Who is a great Soviet filmmaker. And do you have any questions, comments, insights, observations about what we saw at the end of yesterday's class before we move into today's? It can be about the period of time or about the film or the music or whatever. I have nothing to say. I just observe and suck things in like a sponge. I don't react because everything Mr. Genorio presents to me is just wonderful. Yeah. I felt like the music at times was not really well synced to what was actually happening in the movie. 
Well, yeah, but there was another time where, like, it, the music felt so peaceful, and there was a bunch of people dying. <laughs> well, that's called counterpoint. But I, I get, I get what you're saying. There's also a, a, a distinctively different aesthetic between 1930s music and movies and 2020 that's music true. and movies. Yeah. And some of that is there. Now, some of the music sounds jarring. Also, it is simply true that the recording technology pre World War II makes everything sound tinny. They don't do bass very well. It's 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 only during World War II. I'm not going to say that good bass technology comes along, but that the system of recording sound changes to make the sound richer. Gotcha. Uh, thank you for asking. Yes. It's just funny because the symbolism sometimes really obvious. Like the head knight had. Oh, it's so subtle. Yeah. Come on, it's, it's, the guy with the chicken clock. <laughs> That's great stuff. Or <laughs> what else? What else? Yeah, like the head knight with the horns on the side of the head. You know, yeah. Kind of like the devil. Yeah. yeah. It's just, you know, you wonder how people don't, don't pick up on that. Okay, well, in Stalin's Russia, anyone who had a reaction that was not scripted by the government would be outed as a thought criminal and uh, uh, sent to a gulag or to a re-education center um, or just killed outright. So you, you don't mess around with what the Communist Party of the Soviet Union wants under Joseph Stalin. Uh, that's, that's just a, a decision to die. Um, but more than that, that's a remember I mentioned the aesthetic differences, the, sense, the differences in our sense of beauty and our sense of euphony and all that other stuff that happens between then and now? I mean, it's 90 years. 90, 100, 80 or 90 years, it's a long time ago, especially in the very busy 20th and 21st centuries. People were simply less sophisticated in terms of consuming media. We, we swim in a sea of imagery and sound. Uh, most of you carry those electronic uh, magic boxes where you can access any information you want at any time. So far, I've been able to continue to refuse to. We'll see how long that lasts. But people in the 1930s, especially in Soviet Russia, to go to a film was a special occasion. And because they weren't awash in various types of symbolism that you see in movies all the time, it, simple things, simple messages would make a stronger impression. Also, there is what is taken for granted. Every Russian knows bone deep, especially at that time, beware of the Germans. And so they walk in with a predisposition to beware of the Germans. So it's, so it's sort of reinforcing what's already there. Other thoughts, comments before we move on? Jackson. Is Russia still the superpower that it was in the past? Oh, Putin would have you believe it is. <laughs> um, Russia is financially dependent upon the People's Republic of China. I'm talking about the Russian Federation today. Russia has a very, a very well-armed military. In fact, unlike us, they've invested in continuing to modernize their air force. Our primary fighters, except for small numbers of stealth fighters, are were designed in the late 1960s and built in the early 1970s. The Russian Su-27 family of fighters is incredible. Um, they're not stealthy, but they're really good at air superiority. Russian tanks, the Armada, very good tank. Russian submarines are getting quieter and quieter. The problem is the Russian population and economy can't support them. So in effect, through quiet means, and I will call on you next and you after, the Chinese are uh, financing uh, Russian arms so that Russia is a plausible threat to the Eastern Europeans. The Poles, for example, are desperately concerned about being left high and dry like they were at the beginning of World War II. That's why Poland is a very strong member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the United States alliance with Canada and the Western European nations in a defensive alliance against a newly expansionist Russia. Putin himself has waxed rhapsodic about the days of the Soviet Union when Russia controlled Ukraine, uh, Moldova, Belarus, the Baltic states, and um, there is this sense that Putin wants to return to that. 
if given any opportunity. And what Putin and the Russian Federation's military did in Georgia about, uh, let's see, 20, no, about uh, 13 years ago, they invaded Georgia and then they pulled out. I'm not talking, obviously, the Peach State. I'm talking Asian Georgia. What they did in taking the Crimea from Ukraine, what they've done in terms of taking the Kharkov or Kharkiv region of eastern Ukraine, these are all things that make people genuinely concerned that Putin is an opportunist, and if he has an opportunity to expand, he will. If anyone wants to offer a comment on Russia, uh, uh, be my guest before I take the next person. You don't have to. I'm not trying to single you out. I just thought. No? No, I have no comment. Okay, okay. That, uh, they're still kind of living in the Soviet Union because they can't even actually vote for anyone else besides Putin. Yep. And they don't really, they can't openly express yeah. anything against Putin. Putin may be called an, a president, but the fact is there hasn't been a genuinely free election with multiple parties since the time of Boris Yeltsin 20, more than 20 years ago. No, Putin is a KGB colonel, was then, is now. The KGB is the, so, is the Russian version of the Central Intelligence Agency. It's their secret police and spy network. Putin, therefore, counts on, cares about results. He does not care about methods. And he is no admirer of democracy. So it is a democracy in some sense, but it is also an authoritarian regime. Okay, thank you for waiting. So when did color enter the cinematic world? Oh, well, look, uh, a year later, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz was colorized. Um, Gone with the Wind was colorized about the same what time. Was or no, what was, was filmed in color. Uh, Technicolor existed back then. It's just you're not going to see many Russian films use it because that is luxurious capitalist swine need color. No, we in Soviet proletariat cinema like to have images that are deep not bright and, I, and yeah i have a lousy accent i know you get the idea yeah no there was color available but mostly in hollywood and hollywood even until the mid-1960s many hollywood movies that were serious were in black and white one of the greatest movies about world war ii the longest day was made in 1964 at a time when almost everything was made in color but it was filmed in black and white because it was seen to be a serious topic. And there was this sense that black and white is a serious medium. Color is for kid, kid movies like Disney. Sir, you mm -hmm. had your hand up. Yes. So talking about the Russian military, mm -hmm. the things that I've observed from them from like the Cold War to now is in the Cold War, their whole philosophy behind their equipment was just make as much of it as you can. It doesn't really matter how good it is. Yeah, throwing up crap mass armies. Yes, yeah, so throwing up crap at the wall, some of it's going to stick. Mm -hmm. And now it's more of, okay, let's not build as much as we can and maybe focus on upgrading our equipment as we're the opposite. During the Cold War, we were, okay, we don't need as much equipment as they do, but ours is going to be better. Mm -hmm. Like, in the 90s, we had, our ships had the Aegis fire control system, oh, yeah. which integrates fire control system in the radar in the one thing. They just has been... From uh, half a dozen ships. Yeah. It's just, just to let anyone who yeah, doesn't know what Aegis is. Yeah, go. can track and execute like 200 targets at once. Yeah. As opposed to... Russia, they still have the spinning radar. Yeah. Fire control radar. Yeah. And now we're on the possibility of if it's not broke, don't fix it. Just keep upgrading it and upgrading it. Yeah. Like the F 15, they're making an F 15X. I know. <laughs> like the F 15 I know. No, what we need is a new F 22, is what we need. Well, the, F no problem with the F 22 is just so expensive to make. Yeah, that's why we need a new version that's simple. It's a really good aircraft, but it's just so expensive. Yeah, well, no, and the fact that the Obama administration chose to stop building them means we have a very limited supply. Yeah, like, obviously, like, some of our older equipment is older equipment. It's not that good. But some of the older equipment, like the A-10. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. It's the best plane in the world for its job. Yeah, and then there's stuff like the D-52, which I call it a thing like, a good bomber, really big. Can it's a good bomber. bomber if you have air superiority. Yes, and it's literally half of them, half of the stuff on board doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Like, it, it just keeps falling Look, apart. the American government has stopped investing in keeping ahead of everyone. And that's deeply disturbing considering the Chinese military. Its quality is inferior to the Russians. Its quality is inferior to ours. But the Chinese are capable of both outbuilding us and of be, having newer stuff that's more modern, even if it's not quite as sophisticated. 
the Americans don't even have, we don't even have our own manned spaceship, which is something that drives me into a frothing rage every time I think about it. The fact that we have to hitch rides with the Russians, and excuse me, in space terms, with the bleeping Russians, uh, drives me nuts. We should have our own spacecraft. We should have a real space program with manned missions to orbit and to the moon. We should have a moon base by now. And more than that, we should have modern bombers, modern fighters, modern nuclear deterrent. Because sooner or later, someone's going to test us. Our systems had better work. And if American military is seen to be a paper tiger, using communist Chinese terms, uh, the peace of the world goes to hell. Because Putin, uh, the Iranians, the Venezuelans, the Chinese, the North Koreans, and every other predator nation out there, or nation led by a predatory leader, will strike. Yeah. We hold them in check now. The fear of our military holds them in check now. If our military is revealed to be incompetent, it's bad. Last word. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's the one spot, though, that we're, I think, personally, we're always going to have like, superiority technologically and just in the quality of our guys is submarine service. Like, my dad was on submarines for a while. Oh, yeah. Our... our Russia may be making quieter and quieter submarines. We just keep making, like, our submarines are Los Angeles class, and the earlier ones, they're pretty old. Mm -hmm. But the newer ones, they're like the newer Los Angeles class, and newer Virginia class, even the Ohio class, which are super old. Like, yeah. in Ohio. Well, the, uh, look, Ohio is quieter than the water around it. Yeah, it's quieter than the water around it, so. Unless the captain makes yeah. a oopsie, you're not going to find it. Yeah, we should have still built more than three sea wolves. Oh, uh, yeah, the sea wolf is a uh, well, the Sea Wolf is, is early 1990s, but in some ways it's superior to the Virginia class. We could go on and on, and the rest of the class is going to go, I don't care! <laughs> Thank you, though, and I, I really appreciate the knowledge. Okay, so um, I could be wrong on this, but didn't Stalin die because the doctors were too afraid to treat him? Stalin, okay, that's interesting. That's fascinating that you mention that, because Stalin claimed that there was a doctor's plot against him, mm -hmm. and he was purging doctors. So there was some fear. But Stalin also died because he was old and he didn't take care of himself. He died on a couch, and what, what's interesting is he could have been saved, at least for a while, when people realized that he's there on the couch covered in human waste, and... Um, in a normal country, they would have called the ambulance and maybe tried to save him. They might have, they might not. They left him there, alone. Nobody was ready to disturb Stalin for over 12 hours after he was, I think he had the stroke first. For over 12 hours, the guards didn't let anyone in. And then when they finally went in, they saw him in that condition, and they did not immediately summon the ambulance. So... Fear of Stalin, yeah, led to his death. Whether it was just the doctors or the other leaders of the Soviet Union, that's another question. Anything else? Nothing. Okay. Folks, that's a good discursion. It's not really what I intended to talk about, but actually it, it does deal with Russia. So, what you need to know is that the origins of Russia go back to the Vikings. There were the people of Eastern Europe who, Scythians, Sarmatians, and others, lived in the area north of the Black Sea, in the wide open spaces of what we now call Ukraine and Russia. But around the 800s and 900s AD, Vikings began using the rivers uh, between the Baltic and Black Seas to transit the area, set up trading posts, and even the Byzantine emperor had a Varingian guard of Vikings. These are mostly Swedish Vikings. Now, Kiev, for example, uh, is the capital of the Ukraine, and it is a settlement that was originally found by, founded by Swedish Vikings. Now, the story I've heard, and I've heard this challenge, but I'll stick with it because it's the one I know. I'm willing to listen to other theories. Is that one of the native languages for uh, words for the word blue was Rus, and so the blue-eyed Swedes, who were the Vikings were the blue-eyed Rus. And because these are among the first settlements that become cities in this part of the world, uh, the settlements that are set up before the Mongol times are called the Kievan Rus. And uh, this civilization, uh, this society, had legends like the legend of Baba Yaga, the great witch of the woods, who would steal children to eat 
Baba Yaga is the basis of most of the scary witch legends that you see in the Grim fairy tales. But she's scary. She rides around the countryside in a hut with giant chicken legs, uh, searching out her enemies. But what should Scooby-Doo about that? Really? I didn't know Scooby-Doo went into Baba Yaga. That's some dark stuff. Oh. Yes. I have a really good thing. So Please. my dad is a blacksmith, and our post, oh, what do you call it, where you put the letters in, post box, yes. Mailbox, yes. our mailbox is actually the house with the legs. Oh, that's... It. And it's on a, like a chain, so the, the pole is a chain, and then the box is actually the house with the legs. That's delightful. That's, your father made that? Yes. Oh, I'd love to see a picture of it, just because... Yeah. There's actually an animated movie about that. Really? Yeah, there is an animated Russian movie about uh, the witch and um, the house of flags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you get a link to it, send it to me. I'd love to look at it. Yeah. I, I don't speak Russian, but I'd love to uh, see it. So, the Mongols take over that region of the world. And for over 200 years, they rule. And the Mongols, as I've said before, I'm not going to beat this into the ground today, the Mongols have a very harsh approach to government. It's not nuanced, it's not subtle, it's not indirect, it is the direct application of brutal force to achieve goals. And this is something that does affect subsequent culture. Now, Mus Moscow, Muscovy, is on, the, on a river in central Russia, central, uh, the central Rodina. Rodina means motherland. Rodina is European Russia, basically. Uh, and the Romanov family of Mos Moscow began expanding uh, power, both under the Mongols and in expelling the Mongols from that part of the world, from, from that part of Russia. One of the definitive rulers at the late medieval and early modern period in Russia is Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny. Ivan the Terrible is not called the Terrible for nothing. I mean, the Russians have several czars that are, you know, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and so forth. Now, Ivan the Terrible is called the Terrible for a reason. Uh, Ivan was famous for singling out family members that he thought were trying to overthrow him and having them tortured and having them killed. His bully boys were called the Streltsy. The Streltsy were shooters. That's what the word Streltsy means, as I understand it. They had some of the first, they were the one of the first gunpowder uh, militias or militaries in that part of the world, in Eastern Europe. And he ruled by inspiring terror in all of the people closest to him. In fact, it's much safer to be a peasant out in the middle of Rodina, uh, the, the motherland, than it is to be a nobleman in Ivan Grozny's court. Because if his eye catches yours, and he decides, in a paranoid fashion, that you're an enemy of his, you will suffer before you die. And probably your loved ones will as well. Was Ivan the guy who put people on stakes? In the well, there's Vlad the Impaler that's what I'm from Vlad Romanian the, history, who's the basis uh, of historical basis. Yeah, Count Dracula. Okay. I'm sure that uh, Ivan the Terrible would do uh, impaling. Impaling was a way of getting people to, uh, rep well, not want to break your laws. I mean, impaling in its own way is almost as bad as crucifixion. Actually, in some ways, I think it's worse. Uh, so... How does this go on to affect history? Well, to this day, there are many people within Russia who admire Joseph Stalin. They look back at the glory days when Stalin made the world tremble, when the Soviet Union was seen as the most powerful country in Europe. And it was not just because of the Red Army and its victory over the Germans, and the fact that Russia was able to build some of the most incredible weapons, the T-34 tank, the Sturmovic uh, land attack aircraft, but that Stalin's brutality towards his own people, again, he's the second greatest mass murderer in human history. Stalin kills between 30 and 60 million of his own people, and that's not as a direct result of World War II. This guy... Many pro-Stalin Russians believe 
by being strict and stern like a father should, saved Russia. Had a more gentle or generous or nice or Western ruler been in charge, they argue that Russia would have been conquered by the Germans and the Nazis would have won the Eastern Front battles in World War II. I'm not sure I believe that, but I understand their reasoning. In other words, excuse my vulgarity, it takes a son of a bitch to kill a son of a bitch. And that is the attitude that many pro-Stalin people have within Russia. The idea being that in a normal leader would simply not have been up to the task. It took somebody with Stalin's aggressive brutality to build a state strong enough to fight the Germans off. And Stalin's role model was Ivan Grosny, Ivan the Terrible. Stalin's NKVD, their KGB, their secret service at that time, was patterned in some respects on Ivan the Terrible's Strelzi, his shooters, his men who went around terrorizing. So there is this sense that the best rulers are the most brutal ones. And there comes a point when the Grand Duchy of Muscovy gets large enough by taking some Ukrainian territory, by taking territory around Novgorod, by moving towards the Baltic states, which at that time were controlled by Sweden, it changes to the Russian Empire. So Muscovy becomes Russia. One other thing, the religion of Russia is Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Here's a brief story on that. Um, when the people of Kievan Rus and of Russia in general, uh, that region, were looking at becoming Christians, when the Swedish Vikings who lived there and the natives who lived there were thinking about becoming Christians, they sent a delegation to Rome, and Constantinople. In Rome, they met the Pope. They saw the grand ruins of Imperial Rome, um, and they weren't impressed. Then they went to Constantinople. And in Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, they saw Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia is the Cathedral of Holy Wisdom that was built by the Emperor Justinian. Hagia Sophia is amazing because it is built on a layer of arches, and above those arches are semi-domes, and above those semi-domes is a true dome, and what it looks like is this incredibly heavy dome roof is above you, several stories above you, and it's like it's floating on light because at the base of the arch are a series of windows that let in the light, and the human eye tracks light, not shadow. So the light sort of blares into the light, and you've got this massive stone edifice right above your head that's been there since the what, 500s, 600s AD. It's been through wars and sieges, and it's just floating there. So the delegation were impressed by the Greek Orthodox faith. They were impressed by the fact that the Eastern Roman Empire hadn't fallen. And so they decide that uh, that part of the world will become Orthodox Christians rather than Roman Catholic Christians. When Constantinople falls to the Turks in 1453, which is one of the things that end the Middle Ages, in Moscow they say, we are the third Rome. There was the original church founded by uh, Peter, St. Peter, the companion of Christ. And then when the Western Roman Empire fell, Imperium moved eastward to Constantinople. And then when Con now that Constantinople has fallen, Imperium has moved to Moscow, that we are the third Rome. And this sense that Moscow, that Russia, has a destiny to redeem the world for the Orthodox faith, what in Russia is called now the Russian Orthodox faith, is a big part of Russian culture. The Tsar, the, Rome, the, the Russian Caesar, the House of Romanov, 
was not merely a political office, it was a religious one. The czar was seen as the chosen of God to protect his church. And under the communists, well, I'll tell you that story when we get there. So any questions on Russia before we move on? Okay, the Black Death. I, if I missed anyone, please let me know. I didn't miss Okay. In the 1300s, in the mid-1300s, something happens which does something rather unusual to the population figures. May I please borrow your note pack? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'll give it right back. Oh, those are cute. Um, if you flip ahead to this page, you will see some population data on the population of different regions of Europe. Here, I'll give it back and I'll get my own. So, you'll see uh, population graphs uh, after the pictures, after the maps. Or no, it's before the maps. Where the heck is it? It's near the end of the pages. Yeah, second to last page. Okay, and it's before the maps. In fact, it's on the first map page. So, what you'll see is a chart that says Europe uh, subdivided into regions, Europe subdivisions into regions, and you will see a graph that shows the overall population of different regions of Europe. Now, this graph goes back to uh, the time before Alexander the Great, around 400 BC, um, around the time of the Peloponnesian War. And it continues up through 1975 when the book was written. So what you see is during the Roman, during the period from the Peloponnesian War up through the period after 200 AD, there's a slow and steady rise, and this has to do with Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But then you see a drop-off in population, different sizes in different regions, from 200 AD through about 800 AD. And that's the Dark Ages. That's when Europe is knocked back to a time, to a point where they have no cities. That's where the barbarian tribes ruled over, the Dark Ages, the early Middle Ages. The only institution to survive from the ancient world is the Christian church centered on Rome. Then, after 800 AD, you see a slow rise in population. In fact, you'll see a spike upwards in population uh, in the region of northwestern Europe. That's France, England, and so forth and Western Germany. And then, bum, bum, between the mid-1300s and the late 1400s, there is a serious trough, a trench. That trench is the Black Death. We'll come back to it. European population after the Black Death continues its rise at about the same rate until... you have the rise of the industrial state. The industrial revolution in the late 1700s and 1800s, for all of its pollution, and remember this when we go into the age of pollution, for all of its pollution, the industrial revolution causes a massive upsurge in human population because more people are living longer. More people are having children that survive. And so the population of Europe is on this incredibly high spike. Thomas Malthus was a philosopher uh, a couple hundred years ago who wrote about this. And he gave his name to what is called a Malthusian crisis. Malthus, Malthusian crisis. And what a Malthusian crisis is, is a crisis due to overpopulation. Too many mouths to feed, not enough food. Now, Malthus predicted long ago that the world would collapse because of too many mouths to feed. However, capitalism, what Marx calls the free market, 
applied to not only factories but farming has created an ever-increasing productivity to farms, allowing us to have in this country an obesity problem. And the newest disease that's going to hit the third world in the period after the Cold War is type 2 diabetes, which is a rich man's disease that comes from eating too richly. I know, I've got it. The idea that the world has a maximum population has had to be revised again and again and again because of the cleverness of industrial agriculture. If we were to go back to purely organic food, the global population would max out certainly below 1,000 million or 1 billion people, probably a few hundred million. The world now has close, well, between six and seven thousand million, between six and seven billion people. That would be a mega death like we've never seen. So it is industrial agriculture, the kind of chemicals and farming methods that are so decried by certain people, that allows a population like we have to exist. Now you will see that there are trenches, spikes down on the right side of that graph, and those spikes are particularly for Eastern Europe during World War II. World War I spikes them down, then they go up again, and then there's a massive spike down because of World War II. The country that took the most casualties as a proportion of their population was Poland. But throughout Eastern Europe, there is actually a population reduction as a result of World War II. And if you look at the size of that spike downward, that size is as large or slightly larger than that of the Black Death. But if you look at that spike as a proportion of the population of Europe in the 1940s, you will see that that spike is, 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 is relatively insignificant. In other words, the greatest and most terrible war in human history, the Second World War in Eastern Europe, only causes a temporary downspike in population that does not affect the overall rise in the long run. That's an amazing thing. What that means is, up until the present day, with the possibility of super germs and nuclear weapons, war does not cause the kind of mega death that actually reduces population in the long run. At least we've been lucky in that it hasn't since the fall of Rome. What caused the downspike that was the biggest proportion of population was the Black Death. If you look around the year 1400, you see that spike go down. And if you see that downward spike around 1400 as a proportion of Europe's population, you will see that Europe loses between one-third and two-thirds of its people, depending upon where you are talking. Entire counties were depopulated, where three or four people would live in an area where tens of thousands had lived before. Whole villages are wiped out. Cities are turned into charnel houses. In the Black Death, everyone knew somebody who died. No family, no community escaped its ravages. Poland actually had the least effect, but even in Poland, the Black Death spread. For the rest of Europe, ring around the rosy. The rosy is the bubo, the blister that forms on your flesh because of the bubonic plague for which it's named. Pocket full of posies, the flowers that people kept near their noses to fight and mitigate the constant stench of human death, of human bodies rotting. Ashes, ashes. The dead were burned in mass trenches. We all fall down. Everyone dies. Disease and COVID has not been. COVID is a pandemic in terms of the broadness of its spread. But the Wuhan flu is not, thank the Lord, like 
the Spanish flu a hundred years ago, which was truly deadly. And it's not like Ebola or the bubonic plague. The Black Death, the bubonic plague, was a disease that was not only highly communicable, how easily it is to get the disease, but highly lethal. You will die from it. The common cold is highly communicable. But most people, unless they're very old or very young or very sick, are not going to die of the common cold. Easy to catch, easy to recover from. It used to be that the AIDS virus was a death sentence. But AIDS was not easy to catch. It was passed through the warm body fluids from one body to another during sex. Or, if you touched somebody else's blood, they had the disease and it got into your blood. The AIDS virus outside of a human body was fairly delicate and broke down easily. So it wasn't easy to catch AIDS. AIDS. Some people, unfortunately, caused it caught it through blood transfusion. What a horror show, but we worked on improving that so that that didn't happen. But until more recently, if you contracted AIDS, you were going to die. It's just a question of a few years of increasing in f uh, feebleness and then death. So AIDS was not particularly communicable, but it was highly lethal. The bubonic plague is highly communicable, very easy to pass, and highly lethal. If you catch it, there is a really good chance you're going to die. Whatever age, whatever sex, whatever social standing, you're going to die if you get it. So this changes everything in daily life, making it even harder to have a sunny attitude. The effects of the Black Death are somewhat ironic, though. Ironic? Isn't that sort of darkly funny? Yeah! Because as we understand science, the Black Death, the various diseases, chiefly of which is the bubonic plague, is passed by a flea biting you, communicating the disease to you. That flea is carried on the backs of rats. And European cities were so filthy that they were rat cities as well as human cities. Swarms of rats were everywhere, everywhere, everyone. Even the rich encountered rats as a normal part of their lives. But because people saw the Black Death as a punishment from God or as the work of dirty Jews, yes, there were pogroms, anti-Jewish violence, because of the Black Death, because there was a rumor that Jews were poisoning the water supply. Kill them Jews and you stop the Black Death. Witches were burned at the stake in massive numbers because the Black Death was seen as a curse of evil. Now, we get to the irony. What creature of all God's creatures is the most associated with witches in terms of being demonic familiars? Black cats. Black cats! In fact, all kinds of cats. So, I'm sure you remember what happened. The Europeans decide, not only should we kill damn evil witches, but we should have open season on felines and kill all the cats we can. Which, looking back on it, you can't make this stuff up. The Europeans killed the only animal that could seriously affect and slow down the spread of this horrible disease. Good job. Have a great weekend. Remember, I, you have chapter survey 14 due Monday. No, my clocks are off. Oh, really? Yeah, I've got to fix that. See ya.